Good morning. I, I'd like to start off with a question today. And that question is, what on earth is digital construction? Is generative construction or generative build, as some of our clients are calling it? Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by Ifan Williams, who is the head scheduler at Parsons uh, Construction, also senior project manager. And um, Ifan, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, my name is Ivan Williams. I work for Parsons Construction. I've been in scheduling full time for the last 30 years, spending the last 20 years over here in uh, America and Canada working on heavy civil projects. Thank you. And I think it's going to share one of the projects that they've run uh, with Alice. My name is Rene Marcos. Uh, I'm a second generation civil engineer. Uh, I've built things around the world, uh, just about anything you can think of, uh, underwater uh, pipelines. I've done $350 million gas refineries in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and I've also spent a year in Afghanistan uh, designing and building my own projects from scratch. Uh, spent about a year there as a civilian. And so uh, I did my PhD at Stanford University, uh, and I currently teach the construction management class there. Uh, if you were to look up my LinkedIn, you would see that what we're teaching is effectively a new breed of construction production management. Uh, by using AI, ML, and a number of other te technologies, we've changed how the problem of construction production management is formulated and solved. Uh, what we've built, so Alice, our tool, enables a user like Ifan, and he's going to show you this um, in, a, in a few minutes, um, to generate millions of different ways to build a project. Um, this is extremely powerful because what you do is you set up a rule set in our system and then you basically um, can simulate a, a project. You can add a delay, add a crane, uh, switch the speed of the concrete drying, right? Um, you can try overtime, you know, anything that you want to change, you basically tweak that variable, press the button and it will rebuild it for you. It will generate lots of schedules for you. And so, um, what can you do with Alice? Um, and you can really um, ask and answer much deeper, much more complicated questions that's been possible before. And, and Ivan's gonna show you some of that in, in, in a little bit. Uh, from a schedule perspective, you can change sequence. Alice, every time you press the button, Alice automatically goes through three to six million sequences. Um, labor, you can very easily change the crew mix. You can add crews, remove crews, try over time, Social distancing, health requirements. I'll show you guys a case study on that. Uh, cost, so equipment and uh, cost optimization. So minimizing idle times. Alice automatically starts to squeeze out um, the, the times that the crews are waiting around. So, it, you know, it, making your cycle times more efficient. We've modeled complex constraints, things like uh, spatial constraints, reconstructions, right? Complex reconstructions, right? For buildings that were damaged or need, need rebuilding. Equipment, I've mentioned, you know, cranes, crane locations, movement of cranes, uh, materials. Uh, you can set materials to be consumable, reusable. Uh, materials can be supplied or produced within your system and then consumed by other sort of tasks, um, lay downs and, and so on and so forth. Uh, formwork is a very popular sort of model, the, the modeling uh, that we do. So <clears throat> generative construction or generative build, right? Um, how does it work? Well, it's, it's parametric. And so what does that mean? Parametric means that it's rules-based, right? It's, um, you can change a rule, add a crane, remove a crane, whatever it is that you want to do, and the changes ripple through your project. And that's how I explain parametric technology to myself. Can you ripple through these changes? Can you propagate changes through your system? Alice is now generative, which means that the, the, the software starts to change those parameters for you. So Alice will go through 6 million sequences. You don't manually you know, tweak those sequences. Alice does that for you. Uh, Alice will automatically find the saturation level. So what is the saturation level? Well, you can flood it with resources. And Alice will come back and say, oh, well, if I had as many resources as I could possibly want, here's how many, you know, this project can take. I cannot use any more than eight, for example, steel crews, any more than that, and they're just sitting around. Um, it's a simulation, and that's something that's very, very different between Alice and everything else. Um, 
with current technology today, the human is effectively simulating it to some extent in their head. Um, with Alice, uh, the tool is actually shuffling crews, labor and equipment and materials, shuffling them around in 3D space and time to build your objects, right? To build your project, right? Um, and finally, Alice is an optimization engine, right? You know, we do all of this. It's, it, we change those parameters in a generative way, right? We simulate your construction project, but all of this is done, of course, to optimize um, your project. We, you know, Alice reduces time and cost, and that's how we built it. Every time, you know, the six million sequences, it keeps looking for stuff or tricks or, 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 or patterns that will continue to squeeze cost and squeeze you know, duration out of that project. Um, and now, you know, Ethan will show you uh, an example that they've worked on uh, with some substantial savings. Using this, Alice solves the, the biggest project challenge, and I, and, and I believe that it solves those challenges in ways that haven't, haven't been possible before, right? So let's take a look at, at you know, how, uh, a history of, of sort of digitization or a history of, of technology within our field, AEC. Uh, and the truth is this parametric idea or generative idea uh, has been done and has been done in design, right? It's not something entirely new to our field. Um, the four sort of uh, levels of digitization I use, right, and these are things that I've developed to help me analyze, you know, our, our field. Um, the first level is static. And what that means is that you're basically drawing things on paper, right? And that's where we started. Uh, the Egyptians actually had plans uh, for the pyramids on, on papyrus reeds. Um, so that's nothing new. We then automated that. And so that's effectively representing what we represented on paper in a computer, right? So we can now draw lines and shapes and, and squares and triangles, right? And you can see that a human sort of changes multiple variables, draws multiple lines. The computer still gives you a single option, right? Parametric is when you can start changing variables. You can change the length, the height, the width, the location of a column, and that change ripples through your system. A good example for that is, is Revit, right? Finally, generative, and that's where the computer starts to tweak those parameters for you, right? And generate multiple options for you, right? And you can see that that's been played out in design over the last, say, 30 years. Uh, or before introducing that, let me introduce parametric design through an example. So, um, if I was to draw a cylinder, I would draw two ellipses and two lines. If I want a smaller cylinder, I redraw it. A bigger cylinder, I redraw it. You've got to redraw the cylinder every time. If my tool is parametric, I'd have a height and a radius. I can change those parameters, and the tool redraws the object. Like I mentioned, this has been played out in uh, design over the last 30 years, right? We started with static design, drawing things in paper, right? We moved to automated, so AutoCAD, right? I remember that I, when I was 14 or 15, I spent my whole summer learning AutoCAD. Uh, and it was actually one of the most useful things I learned. Um, after that, somebody invented Revit. And that was a really big leap forward. Revit was the ability to draw something in 3D. And if you change something, if you moved a wall or you change the height of the columns, uh, that would ripple through your, your, your model. And so, for example, if I change the uh, height of my columns, all the, the floor heights would change, right? If I change the location of the columns, all the 2Ds and the, three, the 2D sort of cross sections, the vertical and the horizontal cross sections would all automatically change. Then people started thinking, well, okay, well, I don't want to be the one changing the length and the height and the width. Right. I want the computer to do that for me and explore way more options than I could. So Grasshopper was introduced and that was generative design, right? So you can kind of see how, you know, design has progressed from static to automated to parametric and now finally generative. And this is really in the last, I'd say, three or four years, you know, folks have really started to, I think, lean into this technology. If you've never seen it, uh, you know, highly recommend you look up a YouTube video. It's kind of cool. You can kind of see these buildings kind of get smaller and bigger and sort of rotating and it calculates in energy usage and so on. Well, what's never been done, it's never been done in construction. 
Uh, and that's what we've managed to do. Um, so we've basically taken construction from automated to generative, right? Um, now, that was tricky, right? And, and why has nobody pulled it off, right? Well, the reason is that, that to do that, you really need to teach the computer how to build. And so we've had to teach the computer step by step you know, over the course of really, you know, my PhD and then you know, so four years of the company, the following concepts, precedence, crews. Now these are available in today's technology, Microsoft Project Primavera or any sort of scheduling tool has these. What the tools don't have is space, se sequencing or automated sequencing, materials, consumable, reusable, and something called suppliable. So the tool can now supply. So Alice can actually produce, for example, like three units per day, and you can then use those to, to build. Available cranes and equipment. Cranes, we've got the location, the movement, the radii. Construction methods. So you can tweak things like the duration, the production rate, the prefabrication versus in situ. Overtime, 24 hour calendar sh uh, calendars, multiple shifts. Design options, right? And updated designs. That's a big deal. You can upload a new design, a new uh, Revit file, copy the rule set from the old one, press re-simulate and you're done, right? The, the latency, the time for decisions or the time to simulation is, is now sub 10 minutes. Um, as a result, construction uh, companies are being brought earlier into design, they're being invited to design charrettes or some of our clients are telling us. And of course, delays. Since your tool knows or understands how to build, you've set it up that way, you can add a delay and it will reschedule for you. So how does Alice work? And that's kind of the question. Um, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, it's three pieces. The first piece is the planner. That's where you set up that rule set that governs your project. The second is a simulator. That's the, the piece that crunches those rules for you. Why would you want you know, to crunch lots of mathematical formulas when a computer is really, really good at that? And finally, you can then select some of the results that the simulator produces and analyze them in detail. Notice that um, each solution that Alice produces has an automatically generated Gantt chart, a cost estimate, a 4D video and analytics. Um, a common misconception about Alice is that it's some sort of scheduling CPM tool or, or a 4D tool. Um, for us, the CPM, the 4D, all of that is a, is a side effect. It's a side effect of the simulation. Like I mentioned, that's sort of one of the key differences is that you, it's simulating, it's moving those crews around, building things, putting them back in your resource pool, picking them up and so on and so forth. So one of the questions, well, why do it this way? Why do it in three pieces? Plan it, set up the rule set, simulate, crunch that rule set and analyze it. The reason being is you cannot change anything in that rule set. You can add a crane, tweak that rule set, re-simulate. A delay, tweak the rule set, re-simulate. Uh, I'd like to point out, as, as you'll shortly see, that rule set is fairly straightforward. Most people learn how to use Alice in about a day and a half. We start on Monday morning, by Tuesday evening, they're up and running. Um, the reason is, is that rule set is really straightforward. What tasks do you need to build a given element? What resources do you need to build a given element, right? Calendars, um, you know, if you want cranes, you'd be, need to set the location of the crane and the radius of the crane, things like that, fairly straightforward. And so let's take a look at a couple of case studies that we've run. Um, this is a project that we ran with a client recently. It's a, it's a two and a half kilometer um, a tunneling project, right? And what was tricky about, as you guys know, for tunnels, uh, what's tricky for tunneling projects is removing the dirt. So you have your, your equipment, your tunnel boring machines, whether you're drilling or, or uh, drilling with the TBM or using drill and blast. Um, you've got your calendars, you've got the, the amount of uh, soil that you can remove from these shafts, the movement between these shafts, one of the challenges is that these shafts are not available for the full duration of the project. Some of them will shut down. One of the shafts is now six months late. 
Um, so as you can see, there's just a lot of constraints. Um, you can set up almost any project, any size, any complexity in about a week, you know, sometimes two. You know, if you have the data to start with, the data that you need, definitely, which um, I think is really remarkable. You can sort of set up, we've regularly done this, you know, billion dollar sort of projects in about a week. And you can see this is, uh, these are two of the simulations that we ran here. Um, you can see as a result that, you know, even with a six months delay on that shaft, uh, by resequencing, we've managed to knock that six months delay down to only a 15 day delay. This is the baseline without the six months delay on the shaft. This is what we did by resequencing with a six months delay. Um, you can also see that uh, we've shown how to save the need for an additional TBM or two. The question there was, do we need to use a TBM or two TBMs to mitigate that delay? And our answer was no, if you resequence, you'll actually only be 15 days late, right? Which um, I think is a, is a remarkable result. How do they do it today? Uh, as you guys know, this is a line of balance schedule uh, and you can kind of see here where they start in the tunnel and when they sort of move forward and when they move down. Um, this is trying to basically then, you know, figure out, you know, where are you going to remove the dirt? Where are you going to, you know, how fast are you going to move it and so on. Another thing that we've been asked uh, lately uh, quite often is, is show us the effect of COVID. And so this is a large um, uh, corporate headquarters that we've worked on uh, north of a billion dollars also. Um, you can see here that the baseline is 1,621 days. That's the number that we start with. So the first thing is what we want to know is, okay, well, what's the effect of uh, social distancing? Okay, well, I can fit less people on site. So I'm going to try and reduce the carpenter crews by 50%, steel crews by 50%. Also, I'm going to reduce the productivity by 25%. So notice this is reduction in crew size. This is a reduction in productivity to model hand washing, for example. You can see here that it's basically slowing you down by 11, 36, and 22%. 36% is, is kind of the worst case scenario here. Another thing is that our materials are delayed. Right? Uh, our um, materials, you know, a curtain wall from, from China is three months late. And so that basically shows you that's the 26% uh, effect, you know, on top of uh, some of these numbers that we ran here, right? And lastly, you want to mitigate. And so we start looking at, okay, well, what's the most effective way to get out of the problem? What if we flood it with, with glass crews, right? What if we, you know, flood it with all crews and try overtime, right? And it turns out that instead of flooding it with all the crew types and working everybody overtime, which gives you this result here, it's a much better idea to really do 10 hour shift for glass crews and add an extra day. And you can kind of see that that drops us down to 4%, which is really kind of a, a remarkable result given the, some of the delays that we were looking at. That's something that's really powerful with the tool. It, it really allows you to focus your energy on those key critical bottlenecks, right? When with that, uh, that takes us to the Parsons project. And so I'm now going to steal any of your thunder, Ivan. I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you. I thank you, Rene. Um, let me just share my screen. So Rene has had the, uh, the pleasure of telling you what um, Alice is. I've got the pleasure of telling you how Alice works. Um, so on the screen here is a bridge project. So I joined Alice back in, um, sorry, I didn't join Alice. I, I learned about Alice late 2017 when my boss, um, I have a feeling that Rene is still hogs the screen. Um, I can see your screen, I think. Uh, I'm okay. not sure. So I joined, uh, I, I first learned about Alice in 2017 when my boss asked me to um, check out this new, pro new, new, new program and to um, run it against an existing project I was already working on, which was this bridge project down in Arkansas. So this is the, the working area of Alice. It's, it's basically similar to a 3D model. You can see you can actually move it up and down. 
Um, you can do whatever you want with this, zoom into it. Um, and this is where you do everything in Alice. Now, the thing to remember in Alice is we're not scheduling the whole project in one go. What we're going to be doing here, in, what we do here in this 3D model is take each individual element and we construct that single element. Alice does all the other positionings that need to be done with respect to when the element is being done. Um, the only thing we do with the 3D model to ensure that Alice constructs the bridge in the correct format is to create relationships. Okay, it's, it's really a case of I can't do A before I've, you know, I can't do B before I've done A, etc. So if we take a simple um, column here, set here, we've got the piles at the bottom and only when we've completed the piles can we build this wall on top and only when we've completed the wall can we build the, co the, uh, the columns. Only when we've completed the columns can we do the pile cap. As you can see, as I was clicking through the various, uh, the various elements, we were getting different colors coming up. So yellow is the current element that we have selected. Blue is the next one in the sequence. So the blue is dependent on the yellow being completed. If we click on the next one, you can see we now have the purple here, which is the, the supporting element before we can build the wall. And after we've built the wall, the, the columns are the, um, the follow-on uh, elements from that. Um, once we've got these support relationships up on the 3D model, then we can start building the items within Alice that we need to tell Alice how to build those things. So if we look around the screen here, this is the area that we're going to be working in initially. We can set up our resources. Now the resources is obviously everything that we need to build this job. It could be labor, it could be equipment, it could be cranes, it could be material, and we also have rates and calendars. We can set our labor and equipment up initially, or we can actually set it up as we go. So as we develop a recipe and we need a piece of material or we need an equipment, we can add that to the resource pile. So if I just click on one column here, okay, we now have the columns and obviously this is already built. So we now create a recipe for building that column. So this is a simple recipe for building the column. It consists of a number of boxes. The blue ones represent the actual steps that Alice needs to take to build that column. The green boxes represent dependencies coming from outside the column. That, so that column might very well be reliant on a different recipe, or it could be controlling a follow-on recipe after the column. The yellow, bo the yellow boxes here track the material that I'm going to be using within that recipe. And so Alice now knows that whilst that material is being used, that um, it can't use it anywhere else. So if I told Alice it's only got two sets of these material, obviously Alice has to wait until this one set gets uh, finished before it can use that again. So this recipe represents the building blocks for building this one column. Now the beauty of Alice is I only need to create the one recipe. Once I've created that one recipe, I can then assign that recipe to all of the other columns that are of a similar fashion. The other good thing about Alice is that it takes the parameters that's been built into the 3D model and we can use those parameters for calculating things like duration. So you can see here we have a calculation here based on the um, the surface volume area of the column and a production rate. So we can create these production rates. That information now tells Alice how long it's going to take to build that column. You can see we have a varying rate here. That's because Alice has picked up the minimum and maximum build time for all the different sets of columns as because they're all different heights. So they have different parameters. So once we've got the recipes, we've now effectively built up the whole model. So now we can bring in a couple of other things that are useful information on the screen that we've got in front of us. Over here, we can now see information with respect to the group. Now a group is 
If we want, don't want to build each column individually, we can group them together as one set of columns. So in this instance, we group, group these five columns together and Alice is gonna build this in the recipe in one go. If we look at the peers down here, we're actually building these, sorry, the, uh, the piles down here, we're actually building these piles as individual piles. So that's the method I've been used, I've used to calculate, to, to, to build this grid. The beauty of the groups is if I type in anything up here, it filters for those items and I can actually select all of those items in one go and isolate them if I want. So I can get useful information over here with respect to the groups I've generated. I could go into recipes. This tells me all the different recipes I have. And if I click on a single recipe, it'll tell me what groups that recipe has been assigned to. Now, down the bottom, we have the, um, the items that we need to maneuver through the 3D model. I'm not going to go into any of these. Um, but the one thing that's interesting here is the fact that this model has 302 elements. Now, even though it has 302 elements, if I look at my recipe list, I only have 50 recipes. So I am building 350 different, 40 different elements on this bridge by use of only 50 recipes. And if we look through the recipes, we can see that if we look at this bench shaft, it's actually um, assigned, uh, got 15 elements to assign to it. So these recipes are being used multiple times throughout the whole project. Now, once we've created the recipes, grouped our items together, put supporting relationships in, we can then go and schedule the whole, the whole job. This is where Alice does exactly what Rene was telling you. It's gonna take my recipes, it's going to take the supporting elements within the 3D model and it's going to build a schedule based on that information. But because I don't have constraints saying do this, do these pit piles before these piles, do these columns before these columns, Alice is going to figure out the best way of building everything in sequence based on the resources I've given it and the recipes that have been assigned to each of the elements. So that's now where we come into this final button over here, which is the scheduling button for our American and Canadian friends or scheduling button for our British friends. If we go into here, the first parameters that Alice comes up with is the base parameters for building that bridge. You can see here, it's come up with four different, um, different ways of building a bridge which didn't last from 40, we can either build it in 435 days or 459 days. Now, whilst Alice is calculating these different parameters, it actually generates a lot more than just the four dots that are on the screen. But what Alice does when it's finished, it gets rid of the dots which are really non-consequential and just shows you the most important dots. Now, this is, at, at this point here, we now have an optimized schedule that can build Alice, that can build the, uh, the, the bridge in 435 days. Now, it just so happens the schedule I had, the B6 schedule I had for this particular job, it also built it in about 435 days. So that at least told me that Alice can match what my P6 schedule has, which I had optimized anyway. But now the beauty of Alice is I can take these base parameters and I can change these parameters based on resources, material, all of this type of thing. And Alice will construct a completely different way of building the bridge in a completely different sequence, possibly shorter, possibly longer, it depends on what parameters I change. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna set up two different um, new parameters for Alice to work on. So I just click on the new schedule up here. I name this, um, give it a name. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to swamp Alice with as many crews, as much equipment as Alice needs, and as much material as Alice needs. You can see all of these things have gone to infinity. So I'm now telling Alice, you take as many crews as you like, as many as many uh, as much equipment as you like, and as much material as you like, and go and create myself a new schedule. I'm going to also set it up with another one where I'm going to define, I'm going to tell Alice, right, 
So I'm going to build my peers a bit quicker. So I'm just going to change two parameters in this list here. One is for the drill peers. Instead of doing it in 575, the quantity of 575 an hour, I'm going to do it in 1,000 per hour. I'm also going to change the, the peers here for the driving. And I'm going to change this from 1,150 to 2,000. And I've given it a name, and I'm going to tell Alice to go off and schedule it. So now Alice is running two completely separate runs. So whilst Alice is running those runs, I'm going to take you on to another project, which I had to check um, Alice out on. And this was this big Canadian highway. It's about 20 kilometers of road. It has about six interchanges, and it has somewhere in the region of 20 structures in it. And the idea here was to now see what Alice did with a, light, with, with, a, with a project with respect to crews and all of this type of thing, because it's, this is a bigger project. So after we created it, after we'd uh, assigned Alice to the 3D model, it came up, we, we did some various different um, parameters here to get Alice to build it with the minimum amount of crews, um, material, that type of stuff that we had in here. So once we've done this, gone through this optimization process with Alice, we compared what Alice gave us with what we had in our P6 schedule. So Alice, as far as once, once we did full optimization with Alice, the completion of stage one, and you can see we've got the project date here, which came from the P6 schedule, and we've got the final date that Alice came up with, and you can see it finished at exactly the same time. But the, uh, the, the best part about this was the final completion of the P6 project gave us 27th of October 22 or 1281 days. Alice, once we finalized Alice, came in at 19th of August, 1212 days, which was a saving of 79, 69 days. So you can see that Alice obviously gave us a quicker schedule, but what did that do? What did that mean to us in terms of resources? Well, if we gave Alice unlimited resources to build this job, this is the type of profile for crew utilization Alice was giving us. So you can see most of the crew utilization was in the first season of the work, where we were looking at over 100 crews and very little going on in the second and third season. Because we had a schedule in P6, I wanted to compare like with like. So I was able to, Alice is able to export the information that Alice comes up with, the schedule that Alice comes up with, and put it into P6. So I exported this um, schedule. I put it into P6, and I ran some different crew scenarios in P6 from this unoptimized Alice schedule. So just looking at the Earthwork crew in P6, you can see how I've got a peak here going above 40. The black lines here represents what my aim is to try and reduce crews to, but still maintain the schedule integrity. So the next step obviously was to optimize Alice with all the crews to give me a better crew spread and still finish the job on time. So you can see here, I'm still finishing in 12, 12 calendar days. My crews are now split nicely over the three seasons and we've actually reduced the maximum crew allocation to about 50 crews. Exporting that into P6 and now looking at the same earthwork crew with optimization, you can see how Alice has quite nicely um, spread my crews over the, uh, the, 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 the seasons and given me within my parameters. Okay, same thing with ATM crews. I, this is the unoptimized schedule and this was the optimized schedule in P6. Now, P6 has its own leveling capabilities, which is a bit hit and miss, but you could also go in there if you manually um, schedule P6 to try and optimize things for you, but that's a very long-winded method. Anybody who's been in there to do it, you could spend a day changing all the logic and then realize it's not what you're looking for. You have to go back and start it all over again. The other thing about using the automatic leveling in P6 is that that hard log there's no hard logic, so that leveling is lost when you export. 
But just to see what piece it could do with leveling, I did some checks using the existing P6 schedule I had to see how it would level. So this was P6 pre-optimization for Earthworks again. Use a maximum of 24 crews. Hit the button on P6 for an automatic leveling and it came up with this. Well, yes, it reduced the crews in the first season, but it still gave me an over allocation of crews. Tried the same thing with ATM, pre-optimization with, with P6, post-optimization with P6, Again, moved things around a bit, but didn't give me what I was able to achieve in Alice, which was to maintain my crew utilization within this, um, this area here. So if we looked, if we did a comparison now of P6 and Alice, we could see, we know what the base was, but here is a different crew allocation. So P6 leveled was about 16, for ATM, 20 for the bridge crews, four for clear and grub, 14 for earthworks, eight for electrical. But Alice optimization gave me a lot less crews and I was still able to finish in 12, 12 days. So having done that, let's go back into Alice now and see what Alice has done with respect to the three scenarios. So even though Alice is still running in the background, we can see a marked difference here. We can, using my tier changes, I'm down to about 407 days. So anyway, this is gonna, this might take another couple of minutes for Alice to finish. So like a good cook, here is one I prepared earlier. So we actually end up with the peer acceleration of only 404 days, a saving of 31 days. And all I've done in this schedule is to change my production rate on two functions within the schedule. This one still comes in at 431 days, but I flooded the whole schedule with the maximum number of resources you can use. So, I, you know, I've, I've, I've seen people before where they turn around and say, well, just get more crews. We'll finish it quicker in more crews. Well, okay. Getting more crews doesn't really do anything. But let's just see what Alice sell, says the comparisons are. So now here in the, the scheduling um, view, I'm going to compare a couple of schedules here. So I'm going to pick one from the fast uh, run. I'm going to pick one here from the unlimited resources run. And I'm going to pick the fastest one here out of the optimization one. And we're going to compare these schedules. So straight away, duration. Okay, we know about the duration. We know about the working days. But here, look at these other parameters that come out. The project cost. So flooding the schedule with resources, I'm spending more money on the project cost. I'm saving money on my fastest schedule with just the peer changes. Labor, totally bad use of labor. I'm 1.75 million. These are not real numbers, by the way. It's just a, um, a figure, um, a dollar value, which I put on the, uh, the resort, everything in here to get some numbers out. Crew utilization, okay, now the lower the number, the worse the, 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 uh, the, the answer is. So I only had a 22% crew utilization here, but on my fastest schedule, I actually had 40%. Okay, we can have a look at some of the, the parameters as well. And this tells us the, uh, the different uh, resources I've got in here, what I was allowed and what, uh, what Alice eventually used. So even though I've given it infinity resources for the steel site walkway crew. Alice is still only going to be using three resources. So these are very powerful numbers. And now the other thing we can do here is, and again, the, the end result is the schedule. So let's look at the quickly look at the schedule. I'm about to run out of time, so I better rush a bit here. So the next screen we look at will actually show us the schedule runs and um, over here you can see the Gantt chart coming into play. Over here you can see we've got the 3D model. So we've got everything in front of us here. The, um, we could actually change this display on the left. I should have had one of these earlier. So we show in a Gantt chart here. We can actually change this to show analytics. So we can now see the type of things which, uh, which are relevant to the schedule with respect to resource spread. So this is crew utilization. 
I can actually cut it down to a simple, so if I just want to see my rebar crew, or I want to see my grout crew, or I want to see my drainage and culvert crew, I can narrow it down to all of those. This, uh, the analytics over here, I can actually change to different things like equipment utilization. I can also set this, which I think is cool. It actually shows me how the model gets built using the Alice um, functionality and the Alice sequencing that Alice has built up. You can actually see in real time how Alice builds the crew. Okay, there's a, there's a bit missing there, it's possibly due to the, uh, the, the, the stream. So that's just a quick overview of Alice. It would take a lot longer to give you a better overview than that. So I hope that the overview I've given you at least gives you a pretty good idea of how Alice works. So having got that far, I'm now going to run back to my schedule run and hand it back over to Rene to finish off. You're on mute, Rene. <laughs> Thanks, I found that was really, really great. Um, yeah, so I, I really want to thank you for showing us how Alice works. As you guys see, it's, it's really a new way to do construction or a new way to, to run it. Um, in the course of an afternoon, Ifin generated, you know, something around 600 million schedules. Of those 600 million, the best, um, probably 30 or 40 Ifin would be selected for analysis, you know, yeah. do you remember? Something around, around that. And you can kind of see the results, you know, it, it saved 69 days on the, uh, on the total duration did that by changing the critical path. It found a new critical path that it could implement. And you could also see clearly the, the power in modeling the resource numbers and sort of you know, reducing those. Um, yeah, it, if you have any questions, shoot an email to info at alistechnologies.com. Um, the setup time, like we said, it's usually uh, people will start off with a pilot. Uh, that pilot takes uh, usually you know, uh, a few weeks of going back and forth to ensure the information is there then we can usually run most projects in about a week. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. And with that, I'll open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you. Questions on the Google Doc. Yeah, whilst, whilst we're waiting for those questions, I just thought I'd, I, I'd jump in. Um, the beauty of Alice is it, 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 it can be, the, the more accurate your 3D model is, the more accurate your durations are going to come up in Alice. However, it doesn't end there because you can assign user-defined fields if you want. If your design changes, you don't have to definitely change the model. You can use user-defined fields to start changing quantities, and Alice will work off those quantities to generate your duration. So you can start off with a basic model. And as your model builds up, so the Alice um, schedule that you manage to get is obviously going to get a, a bit more refined and possibly a little bit more um, accurate um, to, 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 be, to, to the extent that when the 3D model is fully complete, then um, obviously the, uh, the, the schedules that are going to be produced are, are a lot more complete. Uh, accurate with respect to duration. So. so I found there's a question here for you. Uh, the question is, how do you integrate Alice into P6 and owner requirements related to schedule submissions on a monthly basis? So I feel like those are two separate questions. How do you integrate Alice into P6 and how do you put owner requirements related to schedule submissions on a monthly basis? Okay, so the, 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 the heavy civil industry that, that I'm in, we tend to be controlled by the owner with respect to what scheduling software we use. So the chances are, if you're in the same, in, you know, that you'll be using a, a, you know, Primavera. Everybody knows Primavera. So what you can do with Alice is you can create your schedule, your construction schedule in Alice. You can then export from Alice into P6. Once you have that construction schedule in, in, in P6, you can now integrate that with the rest of the items that you would need in that for design, procurement, milestones, permits, 
um, land acquisition, all of this type of stuff. Um, what you would then most probably do on a monthly basis is you'd be submitting the P6 schedule on your monthly basis for, uh, for payments, all of this type of stuff. You can keep the Alice schedule in the background and you can actually, um, one of the things you can do with Alice is you can say, well, okay, we finished these parts, so let's take these out of the equation and we can still run Alice um, going forward. So the initial construction schedule can be exported from Alice into P6 and that can be integrated in the rest of your P6 schedule. Um, uh, I'll take a question. There's a question for me, which is, what was your learning process to make the leap from being a civil engineer that designs and builds projects to working with software and AI development? Um, for me, I, I always uh, wanted to sort of figure out how to build better. You know, uh, that's why I went to Afghanistan. That's why I did underwater construction. You know, I, I ended up doing a PhD for that. Um, and so the answer, I guess, is I, I wanted to learn how to build better. That led me to the PhD. And I did what they call colloquially an industrial PhD. So I did three months on and three months off, which means that I went to the lab, built some prototypes, went back to the field, worked. So I was working full time six months a year. And I would work and sort of try the prototypes and, and go between lab and, and, and field uh, iterating on this. And that's kind of how I did it. Yeah. Um, I, I see one here, um, question from Eric. How are you telling Alice what the MOT is for the job? How the traffic needs to be moved around so that you can build other parts of the project? Is that done through the logic or through recipe? Um, the answer to that, the, the, the quick answer to that is it's a bit of both. Um, what you have in Alice is you have a 3D model, which is really your finished product. What you don't have is what you started with before you build the finished product. So what we can do in Alice is we can add various building blocks. So we add, we add blocks to Alice. We can use these blocks as staging. We can use these blocks as for um, temporary uh, traffic switches. We can use the blocks for um, you know, the completion of stage one, start stage two. So with respect to MOT, um, if you take the, the 20 kilometer job, it was live traffic and we had traffic going down the center and we had to build the outside lanes. We also had to reconfigure all of the intersections. So I have a single block which ties the completion of the outside lanes and the intersection into a single block. That single block now tells me that I can do the traffic switch to the outside lane and move into construction on the inside lane. So it's a combination of recipes, the recipes would be for MOT switches, um, temporary lane closures, all of that type of stuff. So um, that's really how we deal with MOT in Alice. Thank you, Ivan. You've got a question here from, uh, from uh, Simon. You mentioned that many people learn how to use Alice in a day or two. Uh, I may have missed the but in what specific ways do you ensure that Alice is easy to learn and use? Uh, the answer to that is, uh, you know, from the, the question that I got asked previously, um, it's because Alice was uh, always and will always be, we, we, we like to say that we're a construction company that does software. Uh, I'm not a, a software person that learned construction. It's the other way around. I, you know, my father was a civil engineer. I've been in construction sites since, you know, I can remember, you know, six or eight years old. And so the software, you know, to my knowledge, Alice is a software, one of the very few that has been built from the first line of code to think like a, a civil engineer. Uh, the recipes, you know, are, they're just very intuitive. Like, what do you want? What do you need to build a concrete column? I need to put some concrete, put some steel, pour the concrete, dry the concrete, remove the form of, you know, those sort of things. What resources do you need to, to put, pour concrete? Well, I need some masons, maybe a concrete pump, right? Like the, the way that it was built from the ground up was really, you know, thinking like a civil engineer. And that's why it's so intuitive, right? Um, we also, you know, of course, like most software companies, but I think we put really a lot of effort into listening to folks like Ifan and our other users. And we have a very rapid sort of iteration cycle and bringing that feedback in and, and, and putting what, what the users want back into it. And that's, I think, 
the two key parts to it. One, it was built by a civil engineer, right? Two, um, we really have put a lot of effort into, you know, bringing back feedback from our clients into the software. Okay, we've got a question here from Alex. What was the light bulb moment that made you decide to use Alex? Was it a demo or something else? Um, the bridge project I showed you was what I first used um, when dealing with, when looking at Alice to see how Alice performed with respect to a live a live schedule on a live project. So the project was already underway before I even started using Alice on it. Um, the beauty of that project was, and that is, Alice came out in much the same format as the P6 schedule I was using. The next task was to use it on something bigger, and that's when we came to that 20 kilometer highway zone. The idea there was to see how Alice performed on a roadway that had many different building blocks, lots of different um, things going on, different intersections, structures, main line, you name it. So we ran the um, Alice on that, and using that, we were able to see a marked difference in um, true utilization. And we, we saw some of the examples of that in, in, in the slide presentation. We also saw that we could actually save time on the project. Now, depending on what the contract is, that might not be a good thing um, because sometimes you have to ab abide by the substantial completion date. And obviously if you come in early, sometimes the owners might take away some of that flow for its own use. So using it on the 401 certainly gave us the insight of the benefits of using a program like Alice. For, you know, for all sorts of day-to-day -day use for crew utilization and everything. We're currently running Alice on another two projects um, within Parsons. Uh, one of those, we're actually running um, Alice on a bid project that we're dealing with. The beauty of running it on a bid project, bid project is that you can now use the information that Alice gives you to streamline and sort of do some uh, you know, make sure that the bid that goes in is basically going to be how you're using it because you now can accurately um, figure out how many crews you need, what material you need, all of that type. But you could also use Alice on a project that's in trouble. So you could build the Alice up, you could take away the items that have already been built, and Alice will now tell you how long it's going to take to build the remainder of the job and you can do various different scenarios to figure out what extra stuff you need to, do, to, to try and accelerate that. So we tried it on those two projects and having tried it on those two projects, we're now using Alice in our, um, on, on some of the projects that we're actually dealing with. We'll take a question from Nick and maybe you and I can both answer it. Um, the question is, what do you think sets Alice apart as a generative design tool compared to others out there? Um, that's very easy. Alice is not a generative design tool. Alice is a generative construction tool. There are several de generative design tools there uh, and or parametric even. It's never been done in construction. There is no other generative construction tool to my knowledge. And then I guess, you know, handing it over to you, Ifan, what would you say is like the key differences using a generative construction tool versus something like Primavera? Well. In Primavera, if I've got 432 elements, I have to create 432 different bits of the schedule. In Alice, we saw on that bridge project, I've got 430 elements, but I'm building that with 50 different records. So the beauty of it is I don't have to worry about, do I do pier one before pier two? Do I do bent one before bent two? Where do I go after I've done bent two? I know I'm going to do the piers, so which pier am I going to do that? I don't have to worry about all of that. I just say, tell Alice, Okay, this is how you build a column. This is how build, you build a pier. This is how you build a pier cap. Now go ahead and do it. So Alice will come back with lots of different sequences and I can choose whichever is the best sequence for me to go and build that job. Cool. I, I am not telling Alice how to build. I, I'm merely giving Alice the insight as to how to build an individual element. Alice is going to tell me the best use of my resources uh, to go and build all the rest of the elements. So I have one recipe that can build 10 different parts of that, 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 that um, the, the bridge bridge. And 
the functionality is I can use the total volume of a column, a production rate, and Alice will then completely work, work out the duration for building that column. I don't have to worry about it. And if I want to change the sequence, if I want to add screws, if I want to add material, Alice will tell me whether that's going to be cost effective or not. To do that same exercise in P6, and if anybody has ever done that, they could be sat there for days trying to figure out the different sequence of construction, trying to figure out if extra material is going to help. Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it takes a lot more difficult. There's a, a question here from Matthew that sort of ties into what we're talking about now, which is, did you run scenarios on materials such as forms, fast dry concrete, etc.? Did you find any advantages that might not have through traditional methods? Um, on the $600 million, million dollar job, the, um, the issue there was mainly crews. The, the total 20 kilometers was split up into nine different segments. So potentially, you've got nine separate crews working in nine separate segments. The, um, all of the structures that we had were pretty um, unique and individual. So. I couldn't use material from one structure to another structure because of the different types of structures that we were building. So you could say the main task of the 20 kilometer highway job was building roads. Well, it takes a lot of crews to build roads. You've got various different, um, you, you've got the intersections, you've got the main highway. So really it was a case of, well, I've got eight segments, do I, nine segments, do I have to have nine sets of crews or can I, jump crews from one segment to another. So that was the main function of running Alice on that 401. And that is to see if I could still build it in, 12, in, in, in a short time as possible. But what was my crew count going to be? Could I get away with 10 crews or do I have to have 20 crews? Do I have to have nine completely set, complete sets of crews for the nine different segments or can I jump around between them? So, the savings in that case would have definitely been in crews, um, the use of crews, and obviously if um, if you look at the, the, the 69 days it came in earlier, that's a potential saving of 69 days on overheads at the end. The actual, uh, the actual cost, um, I'm a scheduler, I'm not a cost engineer, so I can, I can tell you what things take in time, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how much, how much, you know, how much it costs things. But, 69 days on a job that size is a pretty big savings on um, overhead. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I can also say that we've run it on different, you know, we did one with the build group in, uh, here in San Francisco. They saved the number of forms from 10, 10 pieces of formwork to six, saving them $100,000 on that job. We've done fast drying concrete on the project in Poland. Um, I'd have to dig up the, the results, but you'll generally see sort of in that 17% average on the duration and somewhere on the 13% for labor and equipment. I guess we'll take uh, one final, there's a quick question on what BIM formats it supports. Um, you know, uh, anything from the Autodesk suite, anything IFC, anything Navis works, which covers just about anything you want. We are now working on and we'll be releasing further integrations into the software. Um, you know, namely, for example, for the Bentley suite. Um, so that answers a quick question there. The last question we'll take, many construction firms, including my own, are currently facing an uncertain future and financial difficulty due to COVID. Would you say that the benefits of Alice are visible short-term or is it a long-term investment? Um, definitely it's a short-term investment. Many of our clients have come back and asked us to run simulations on, you know, if something is delayed, how can we mitigate that delay? That's a, that's a big one, right? If, if we have to stop work uh, because of uh, COVID, how can we restart it? If there's a limited amount of resources on the market now, what can we do basically to mitigate that? How can we, you know, find me a sequence that, that squeezes the biggest performance out of the resources that I do have, right? Um, what is the effect or what will the long-term effect be for this project if my productivity rate has been reduced, right? Um, what happens when I reduce the number of crews because of social distancing? Those are all things that we're running. Furthermore, as you guys can see, um, how can I reduce cost and duration, right? How can I basically squeeze more performance 
out of the resources I have? How can I find me a different critical path through this project or find me a different way to sequence the work so that, you know, the idle times get reduced, right? So those are all things that we can do in the short term um, to help with, with COVID or, or otherwise, right? So I think... Can I just no. take one last question, which I think is important, um, uh, from Miguel. Sometimes during early pre-construction, a model is not provided by the architect and or there isn't time to create our own. Is there any way to use Alice without a 3D model or how have you overcome these, these uh, challenges? Well, in simple terms, you can't use Alice without a 3D model, but notwithstanding that, Alice does, the Alice um, team, does have a full 3D modeling capability. So you can get away with a basic model because now you can use UDF fields to give you the relevant volumes, etc., that you need for duration. So um, the Alice uh, team does come with that. You know, if, if the architect hasn't given you a 3D model and providing, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Rene, providing you have the relevant um, drawings, etc., then Alice does have a 3D modeling uh, team that can, that can actually put a 3D model together for you. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that 3D model is usually something relatively quick. You know, um, most, if you're building a, a sort of a regular building, we will put that CIM, construction information model, uh, together in, in a few hours, right? For these mega projects, you know, mega sort of infrastructure, unique kind of, you know, projects, you know, sometimes it can take us, you know, five days, sometimes, you know, two weeks on the really outer end if there's something, you know, very tricky going on. But we can easily put those together for you. Um, most of our clients, you know, if, if it's something relatively simple, the CIM is usually a lot simpler than the BIM, right? The construction 3D models don't need as much information as the, uh, the architectural ones. Um, I didn't notice that there was three more questions and, and uh, to my understanding, we're allowed to, to finish them. So I, I guess we can just, um, just go for that. Uh, if that's okay with you, Ivan. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's a question here. Does Alice pick up data from any 3D platform? Um, like I said, you know, you can use anything from the Autodesk suite, uh, anything IFC, and anything that Navisworks ingests, which covers just about anything. You can o save almost anything into IFC. We're working on further integrations. For example, I know that we're looking at Bentley integrations right now, um, but we have had success in saving the IFC and then opening an Alice, right? Um, so we've answered that. I see a question here. Does Alice have built-in delay calculation features? That, that's a great question. We have not done, it would be really trivial and easy for us to just randomly throw delays in your, in your software. Um, we didn't think that was too useful because you, you're like, well, where did Alice throw the delays and are those where I think those delays are going to go, right? We are very shortly releasing something that we think is incredibly powerful, which is, which is a similar twist to the question that's being asked, right? And I think that's really sort of where, where Salim is going with this. What we're doing is we're basically looking for which tasks are critical in your schedule. Now, the, the difference between what Alice can do and what a CPM schedule can do, CPM can assert which tasks are critical for that sequence. With Alice, what we're gonna find for you is which tasks are critical for all sequences. So what we're gonna be, what you're gonna be able to do is you're gonna be able to sort of, for example, uh, add overtime, but add overtime only to the specific tasks that will basically change the duration across all, all sequences. So even if there's a delay your, your, your overtime uh, assignment will still basically have an effect, if that makes sense, right? Normally, if there's a delay and you resequence, all the sort of calculations that you did go out the window. You've got to redo them. And so what we're, what we're going to enable you to do is basically run you know, millions of sequences and then find the critical tasks. And, you know, the way we do it is by building in delay calculation features. So we delay specific tasks and we see which of those delays affect all sequences. So that's kind of what we're, what we're releasing there. And I think that's it. Um, great questions, really. Uh, very much enjoyed them. Ifan, thank you so much for, for uh, hopping on the line today and, and sharing your experience with Alice. Um, 
like we said, if you guys have any questions, uh, please shoot us an email. Uh, and thank you so much to the Festival of BIM for uh, putting together this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renee and Ivan, and a big thank you as well to everyone who joined us in the audience today. You will all receive an on-demand copy of today's session via email. For those who've had questions and answered, we'll be sending these questions to the speakers and we'll have their responses published on our website. If you have any feedback or further questions, please email info at festivalofdigitalconstruction.com and we'll come back to you later this week. Our next webinar will take place on June the 15th at 9.30 a.m. UK time with a presentation on Open BIM Standards Global Adoption. This will be followed by another presentation on how to manage a $4.3 billion BIM project. You can sign up for both of these via our website. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you all and stay safe.